He said there's this myth that people believe that, well, if it's our public debt, then it's really debt that we owe to ourselves, so we don't really have to pay it back. Hume's view is that even if in some sense we we owe it to ourselves, the we is not the same as the same um, individual person as ourselves. One group is having to pay the benefits, whereas this different group is actually getting the benefits. And that is really dangerous for um, any kind of the survival of a society. Hello, and welcome back to the Essential Scholars podcast series. I'm your host, Rosemary Fike, and today we're going to continue our conversation about David Hume. Once again, I have James Audison joining me as my guest. He is the author of the Essential David Hume book. He's also the John T. Ryan Jr. Professor of Business Ethics and the Rex and Alice A. Martin Faculty Director of the Notre Dame Deloitte Center for Ethical Leadership in the Mendoza College of Business at the University of Notre Dame. He's a senior fellow with the Fraser Institute and a senior scholar at the Fund for American Studies. And I am so happy to have you back on the podcast yet again. Welcome. It's, it's my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me, Rosie. So we were talking about the revolutionary ideas of David Hume last last time we were sitting together. And uh, one of the things we didn't get a chance to talk about is, you know, to the extent that I want to, his uh, views on international trade um, and and why his perspective on trade policy was really distinctly different from the dominant view uh, of his day. Uh, you know, what what views are is he challenging? Why does he reach such a different conclusion about trade than a lot of his contemporaries? Yeah, it's a, it's actually pretty remarkable when you read you know his writing about trade because it's captured um, it's contained in just a couple of short essays that he wrote. So he didn't write any long systematic treatise about economics like Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. You know, it's a thousand pages long. There's nothing like that about economics or political economy from Hume. He just has a series of essays where they and they're usually pretty short, four to five, maybe ten pages long. They're not very long. Um, but they just have these brilliant insights. Um, and so among them are um, a couple of essays about where he talks about trade. Um, and one of the arguments that he makes about trade, and these are really, you know, so he's not presenting data about it. It's really a kind of a conceptual argument. Um, the, what he was thinking about at the, was a dominant theory or, or pre, a predominant theory at the time that we, that's called mercantilism. Um, and this idea was that wealth is really really consists in gold or silver it consists in pieces of metal in the sense that the more of these pieces of metal you have the wealthier you are um, hume wasn't so sure about that because as uh, hume sort of remarks you know he's a bit of a wit um so he, you know he puts us in a bit of a funny way but he says well you can't eat gold um and you can't really use gold to build a you know a roof over your heads Maybe if you had enough, you could do that, but it seems kind of impractical. So what really is the value of these little pieces of metal, of yellow metal or silver metal? Um, and what he suggests that the value of them is not the, the possession of them themselves, it's what they enable you to do. So it seems more like they're a tool to enable you to do other things. So a rich person is rich, not, not directly because you have a lot of pieces of gold, but because you're able to satisfy a lot of your wants and needs, that seems to be the, the definition of, of, of wealth. Um, and the gold is really just a, a means to an end. Um, so that seems kind of intuitive, and maybe that seems intuitive to you or to the audience today, but um, this had pretty Im profound implications on policy at the time. Because if you think about it from the other perspective, if you believe that really, you know, that a country becomes rich if it has a lot of gold, um, then what kinds of trade policies, for example, would you have with other countries? Um, well, what you would really like is for your citizens, the citizens of your country, not to buy from other countries, because if you bought from other countries, then you'd be shipping your gold to them, making them rich. Instead, what you want is the citizens of your country to sell to other countries, but to buy only internally. So what you would do is you would set up these trade barriers and tariffs so that we don't. We want to discourage people from buying um, goods and, from other countries, and encourage them to uh, uh, to buy goods from our own country. So you would put these um, these tariffs or trade barriers in place, 
And then, but of course, other countries would reason in the same way. They, they, you know, so England would want uh, English citizens not to buy from France. France would want French citizens not to buy from England. And so they would put these sort of mutually punitive uh, tariffs in place that had the end result of just discouraging international trade. Um, so you just had less and less international trade going on. What Hume says is, well, this is really not understanding what the purpose of trade is. People trade because by doing so, they make both parties better. I trade with you or I partner with you because you and I are both better off. And remember, when an English citizen or a British citizen buys, say, wine from France, yes, you're sending gold there, but what do you get? You're getting the wine. And presumably, if you wanted to, if you were doing that voluntarily, you wanted the wine more than the gold. So you're actually better off for doing that. And of course, the French can't eat their gold either. They're going to have to do something with it too, which, you know, maybe they're going to buy other goods from Britain. So what Hume says is that this whole thing is rest, uh, th this idea of having tariffs and trade barriers is just a tissue of confusions about what wealth is and about what trade really does. And what he says is the best result would be to tear down all of these barriers and let people trade with each other. And remember, the other little aspect of it is he's got this funny line where he says, you know, he, as, as a British citizen, he actually prays for the benefit uh, or, or the increasing prosperity of Germany and, um, and uh, Portugal and Spain and even France. <laughs> you know, the British, they all hated France so much. Even France. I even. And why would that be? He says, well, because remember, if a country, if another country is extremely poor, then there's no benefit to us either. You're not going to be buying and selling from a country that's destitute in poverty because they're not making anything. They're not producing anything. So what we want, it will make us better off if everybody is benefiting and we should stop being so jealous of other people benefiting. We should just look at, the, that, at that as increased opportunity for us to benefit. So this is really kind of shifting how we view wealth how we view what trade can accomplish right so the mercantilists they have this view of wealth that it doesn't get bigger right we have this yeah. finite amount of wealth and if i trade with you it's not a win-win situation one of us wins one of us loses right and that creates a very different type of policies um, if you're viewing every potential trading partner not as a partner but as uh, you know, an enemy, as an adversary, right? And, and you know, and we still talk about that a lot. We use that language to even today, don't we? That where we talk about, I mean, you know, think about uh, people who write books about uh, negotiation. You know, the art of negotiation. They usually talk about it in terms of, you know, it's like a war where you want to win against the other person. You know, you win by by reducing the other person or taking from the other person. Yeah, Hume says, uh, Hume's view about that is that it's, in some sense, it's, I guess, natural that we think in those kinds of those sort of positive, or the, uh, sorry, zero sum terms that um, because historically speaking, it has usually been the case, you know, how did one empire get its wealth? How did the Roman Empire get so wealthy? You know, they built the Colosseum and the aqueducts and all of that. Well, by taking it from other places, they enslaved other places, occupied other places, stole their land. And yeah, so historically speaking, that is how a lot of the so-called great human civilizations got their greatness is by taking it from others. And when you just take it from others, that is a zero sum exchange. It might even be a negative sum exchange if you're you know, destroying assets like human beings in the process. Um, but it's not increasing the overall size of the pot. That's a very different game, as you suggest. You got it exactly right. From Hume's perspective, what goes on in commercial societies, what goes on in commerce is a very different thing. As long as you have the right to say no thanks, what I call the opt-out option, that's my term, that's not Hume's, but if, if everybody has the right to say no thank you, then if you said yes and I said yes, then that means we're both benefited. We wouldn't have done it if we both didn't benefit. And the nature of those kinds of transactions is positive sum. And the more you have of those, by thousands more of those and millions more of those, the more you have, then the more overall increase, the uh, increasing prosperity you have on net. And that's really the secret to growing the pie, not just further sub, um, subdividing what pie we have, but actually making the pie much bigger. So this is, you know, Hume definitely raises challenge to challenges to our modern political conversations surrounding trade, right? We hear mm -hmm. political leaders talking about, we need to renegotiate this trade deal so we can win at trade yeah. without <laughs> thinking that everybody kind of wins at trade. 
Yeah. Um, so what would Hume say to modern leaders, political leaders? You know, what types of rules should we have governing our international trade policy in order to enhance human flourishing? Yeah, I'm afraid it wouldn't, uh, it, it would be pretty blunt and pretty short. Um, knock it off, I think is what he would say. Um, because, um, I mean, you know, one part of, I think, the human picture is that you is that we have to remember that it's not countries that trade with each other. It's people, it's individuals. You trade, I trade with you. So it's not China that trades with uh, the United States. It's people in China buying and selling goods um, in the United States and people in the United States buying and selling goods from the, um, from China, et cetera. So if we think about what's really, you know, what really is our goal? And maybe here's the sticking point, even for contemporary politicians. What really is our goal? Is our goal that we want to crush all the other countries and make them bend their knee toward to us? Okay, if that's the goal, then yeah, maybe all of this sort of jingoistic, you know, uh, you know, our country first and you will, you know, we're gonna uh, have this war of trade, trade wars and all this, then okay, then maybe all that makes sense. But I think Hume would say, is that or should that really be our goal? Maybe what our goal should be is allowing more and more people to lead lives of meaning and purpose, um, generating enough prosperity so that fewer and fewer people are in poverty more and more people are rising out of poverty and able and are able to have the time, talent, treasure, the ability, the leisure to dedicate their lives to things that are less miserable and more fulfilling. If that's the goal, um, then maybe that suggests a totally different set of policies. Then maybe what that suggests is even, I mean, here's you're an economist, so you tell me what you think about this, but but Hume might say, even might recommend even a unilateral free trade policy. In other words, even if every other country in the world is protecting its its uh, native goods or its you know the domestic po uh, production, um, our country should still have no tariffs, no restrictions of any kind. Let anybody trade with anybody who wants to. What do you think of? I think that would be Hume's suggestion. I mean, you can say what you think about that as a contemporary economist. I mean, as I am probably one of the fewer economists that would say I, I would be okay with that. I know that a lot of other economists might say retaliatory, even Smith, retaliatory yes. tariffs are, are justifiable. You know, economic mm -hmm. sanctions for you know justice purposes might also be justifiable. Um, but I tend to be the no trade barriers, no immigration barriers kind of person. So I would have been right with Hume. But speaking of what would his view of immigration? We, so we talked about international trade. Are there implications of this for things like, uh, you know, moving people across borders, not just goods? Yeah, you know, uh, so Hume tend to, tended to uh, think that immigration was a good thing for humanity also. Now, you know, um, and there too, he was uh, out of step with the time, with the contemporary thinking, because um, you know, in his day, and maybe this is true also to uh, to uh, to some extent today. But you know, people tend to talk about a certain kind of you know, our country has a culture. You know, we th this is our country. We have our a certain culture and a certain history. And if we get too many people coming from other cultures or from other countries or with different histories, it will dilute our culture or destroy our culture or change it and unrecognizable or unpredictable ways. And so people get very nervous about having too much in immigration and maybe some is okay, but not too much. Um, that was certainly the view that people, that many people had um, in the 18th century when Hume was writing. I mean, it was even, uh, you know, what today might strike us as a little bit uh, humorous, but you know, people, you know, in, the English didn't want to have too many Scots you know, or too many people from Wales or Ireland, because, you know, these were totally different cultures. And what would happen if, you know, in England, we had too many people from these other countries that spoke basically the same language and had the same lineage and basically the same history. They were still nervous about it. Um, but Hume, um, Hume took a different view of that. Hume thought that, you know, I, I'm not sure this meant that he would be a totally, you know, an open borders person. Um, but he did seem to think that human beings, um, moving across cultures you know if, if human beings wanted to come to our country if other humans wanted to come to other to our country um chances are that they were doing this for good reasons they wanted to come to contribute they were either looking for a better environment for themselves or they wanted to contribute in some way there was something attractive about what we have what we offer and they want to be part of that um so he was a little bit less i think worried about 
in destroying our institutions or destroying our culture if we had immigration than a lot of the people in the 18th century were today. And I think that probably would be, I mean, you know, we're extrapolating a bit, but coming into the 21st century now, um, my guess is that that would be, um, that would be Hume's position today too, that we should, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean having completely open borders, but maybe, you know, the default being to allow more immigration rather than the default being to allow less. Or just make it easier to immigrate than it currently is, yeah. for sure. Right. Um, so something you brought up a few minutes ago, you mentioned consent, right? The opt out mm -hmm. option or oh, yeah. the ability to say no, withdraw consent. Mm -hmm. Um, consent seems to be a major part of Hume's view of justice. And in our modern policy conversations, there's a lot of, of conversations happening around consent and consent in, in different spaces. Yeah. Um, you know, the, cons the ability to, for me to choose to sell a kidney, for example, is that legitimate? Um, the ability for me to choose for myself to end my own life, right? So, mm. so what are some of the modern spaces where we might be able to look to Hume to, to have more um, engaging, productive policy conversations? That's a great question. It's also a hard one. Um, and that's got a lot of pieces to it. So in general, so a, kind of a preface, I would say just sort of, you know, to remind uh, ourselves about, you know, Hume's general approach to these things. So he was not necessarily a natural rights theorist. He didn't talk about, you know, um, you know, God created the world and was the, you know, the lawgiver of the universe. And there were um, natural, there was natural law and we had natural rights under this natural law. That wasn't the approach he took. Um, it doesn't mean he was necessarily opposed to that, but that wasn't his approach. Um, so when Hume talks about the consent, about human beings giving or withholding consent, um, he doesn't usually couch it in terms of, well, you have a right to say no, or you have uh, no one has a right to take something from you without your consent. That sounds a little bit more like John Locke um, than it would be from uh, David Hume. Um, Hume, I think, takes a slightly different approach. What he wants to look at is, you know, there, th in human history, most times and most places, people didn't were never consulted. <laughs> there, there was no notion of, a, of, you know, you have the authority to say yes or to say no. Um, it wasn't really respected. Occasionally, it is respected. Occasionally, it's respected selectively. Certain kinds of people have this right and other people don't. Um, and because of that, that gives us an ability to sort of look and see, well, you know, what kinds of consequences ensue when we allow people the right to say yes, please, or no, thank you, and where you have to respect that. Um, what Hume suggests is that people who have the right to say no, thank you to offers or to proposals or even to demands, um, what that tends to do is have two good consequences, two beneficial consequences. One, it disciplines um, it disciplines other people from this impulse many people seem to have to wanting to force people to do things against their will. So you're disciplined against that because if you have to respect other people, if, if people say no, and if no means no, you have to respect it, then that disciplines you from um, you know other kinds of bad uh, aspects of your personality that might have been there in the first place. But the other thing that Hume seems to think it does is it allows people to experiment, to try different things. Um, and Hume seems to have a kind of faith. Um, maybe, you know, maybe a critic would say he's naive about this, but you know, he seems to have a faith in the everyday human being to figure out what's good for you, to figure out what really would lead to benefit in your life. And that the best person to figure that out is usually you. It's not somebody else. It's not a third party. It's not even an expert who's, you know, a distant expert, you know, about whatever, humanity or medicine or something. Um, usually it's you. You're the person who has the most intimate connection. You're most directly incentivized to try to figure things out that are good or bad um, and avoid bad things for yourselves. And so Hume um, thinks that this has beneficial consequences, the, that allowing more and more people to have um, this right of consent, which means also withholding consent, um, can have lots of beneficial consequences. Now, he doesn't, as far as I know, and I, uh, I don't think he speaks anywhere about uh, body parts, about selling body parts, although maybe we could, you know, extra, you know extrapolate or uh, take a guess. But one thing he does mention, and you mentioned this in your question, but one thing he does talk about is suicide, um, is whether people should be, um, should be able to engage in voluntary suicide. He actually wrote an essay about that, which he did not publish. He withdrew it. 
Um, and it was published posthumously. It's called On Suicide. So we have it now. It's called On Suicide. You can read it. Um, and in that essay, he um, he takes what would have been um, <laughs> quite a controversial position then and still pretty controversial today. And that is that if a person were really genuinely objectively to come to the conclusion that continuing to live would be on net, on balance, and evil for me, as opposed to not continuing to live, then he says that person might be justified in ending his or her own life. Um, so he doesn't say, you know, you have a right to do it or you have you don't have a right to do it. It is sort of in this consequentialist thing, uh, framework. You know, you're thinking about the the rest of the benefits for living for the rest of your life, likely benefits, and estimating the you know the the likely uh, positive aspects and the likely negative aspects. And if the negative greatly over uh, overpowered the positive, then he thinks that such a person might be justified in uh, taking their their own life, which suggests that he has a pretty robust notion of consent. So I wonder, because um, in the book you do talk about uh, Hume's last few years, he, he was pretty sick. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wonder to what extent did like that time suffering with his illness influence his thoughts about you know, mm -hmm. weighing the benefits of and costs of additional life um, in certain circumstances? It's a good question. I mean, I guess we don't know whether he actually entertained the thought of suicide himself. We have no idea about that. But you're right. He did. Uh, so he had dysentery for the last few years of his life. And, you know, that's not a pleasant uh, way to go. So he was losing weight and losing his appetite and becoming dehydrated. And, you know, and it is accelerated during the last couple of months of his life. Um, but up until right at the, at the very end, um, you know, Hume seemed to have, and this is one thing that we haven't really talked too much about, but Hume's personality, he just seemed to have such a great personality. He was so happy, optimistic, always joyful, loved company, loved telling stories and jokes and laughing with friends. His favorite things to do were to go to dinner parties and tell stories and drink and pat people on the back and play billiards. I mean, he, he seemed to be, of all the great philosophers in Western history, he was probably the one that was most normal and probably would have been the most fun to be around. So he just seemed to be really the sort of person, just his personality was to enjoy life. Um, and um, and maybe for him then, you know, even in the, the end, at the end, as he was dying, he was wasting away from dysentery, that until the very end, that, uh, you know, that calculation of benefit versus loss uh, was still in the, in the positive column for him. He does seem like somebody who would have been fun to to have a beer with and, and, yeah. and talk about life with, um, definitely. Another modern policy conversation that I think Hume might have something to, to say about um, is the issue of, you know, democratic governments accumulating large amounts of debt. Oh, yes. Right. So public debt, we didn't get into it in, in our first part of the conversation, but Hume did have some views about public debt and you know what that can do to a country. Why did he view public debt as, as so destructive and, you know, he even says ruinous, you know, yeah. how, why does he, he uses very strong language there. So, so why does he hold that view? And then, you know, what would he say to modern uh, economists that are advocating for that MMT, modern monetary theory type of, mm, of yeah. policies um, that have been encouraging accumulation of, of additional uh, public debt? I just love to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah, um, yeah, he was not he was um, he was not rosy about the <laughs> to coin a term about the future of, uh, of the prospects of debt. He thought that uh, that public debt was a bad thing, it was a dangerous thing. Um, so he wasn't as worried about private debt. So that was fine uh, for him. I mean, so you know, the idea that you know, if you want to start a business or you want to buy a, a house or something, or you want to, in today's economy, you want to buy a car or send your kids to college or something. Um, and you want to take out private debt in order to finance that, um, perfectly fine. You know, you work that out with your bank or whoever's going to lend you the money. Um, and, you know, if things go belly up, well, then it's only the two of you that have to work, you know, your bank and you have to work that out. It doesn't imperil the rest of society. Uh, but that actually was what he worried about for public debt. So public debt had all kinds of risk factors involved, according to Hume. Um, so first of all, if we're issuing public debt, 
um, that often goes is being bought by foreigners. Um, so other countries, in other words, are buying our debt. And Hume has this general view. And again, you as an economist can say whether you think this is true today or whether this is true or not. But his general view is that whoever owns your debt, in some sense, kind of owns you. Because if, you, if they're only, if you're selling your debt, then they can dictate terms to you. They can garnish your wages. They can impose all sorts of restrictions on you, especially as you become less able to pay it back. Um, so in a sense, who, whoever owns your debt owns you. And that's a very dangerous thing, Hume thought if the people who own our debt are countries who are antagonistic to us. Um, so not just our trading partners, but countries that might want to conquer us or destroy us or invade us, then it becomes very worrisome because then it, it effectively makes us beholden to them. Um, so that was one major worry. Um, and second worry he had was, it means that we have less capital, according to Hume, we, we have less capital in the country available for emergencies. Um, so if we do get invaded, um, if we're into debt up to our eyeballs, well, then we don't have a lot of reserve wealth that we can put to the emergency of needing to fight off a foreign invader, for example. Um, and that would also apply, he thought, to natural disasters. If there was an earthquake or something, you know, that destroyed, we needed a lot of capital. If we're in very high debt, we just don't have a lot of room to, uh, to um, not a lot of margin for error if we have any of those problems. Um, and then maybe one more, we could, I would love to keep yeah. talking about this, but one more worry that he had was that um, he said, there's this myth that people believe that, well, if it's our public debt, then it's really debt that we owe to ourselves. So we don't really have to pay it back. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of the logic behind modern monetary theory, right? If you're a, so if you're a country that is issuing your own currency, yeah. then there's no amount of public debt that you will not be able to pay back because you essentially can always print more money to pay off the debt. Yeah. So um, so I want to hear what you as a modern uh, contemporary economist think about this, but I'll tell you what Hume's, you know, Hume was writing the 18th century. So he's, you know, way before we had theories, you know, well, countries like what we have, wealth levels we have, you know, the United States to take one country, you know, in the last 200 years has created more wealth in real terms than any other country in the history of the world. But we now also created more debt in real terms than any other country in the history of the world. So Hume could not have quite anticipated all of that. Uh, but here's what Hume's view was. Um, Hume's view is that even if in some sense we, we owe it to ourselves, the we is not the same as the same um, individual person as ourselves. And what that means to him is that, well, it's the it's the king and the it's the exchequer and it's parliament that's issuing all of this debt. Um, but the debt is really um, so the, the the funds they get from issuing the debt is being paid out to to citizens or you know, various people who live in our country for various purposes. And um, the encumbrance then is typically on a different set of citizens. So, you know, it's the few, it's the next generation of citizens. It's our children or our grandchildren. So if our children or grandchildren, when the bill comes due, say, well, you know, we don't really want to pay that bill. And if your answer to that is, well, you're right, we don't have to pay it back because after all, um, you know, we just paid it to ourselves or we owe it to ourselves. What that really means is that the, the contemporary beneficiaries no longer are able to get what it was they were getting because the wealth is, cannot purchase the actual goods and services. So you're effectively saying that people on, um, you know, uh, pick your program, but you know, in Social Security, for example, they're not going to be able to continue getting their payments. Or if they do get their payments, they aren't worth anything anymore because the value of the dollars have been so, or the currency has been so deflated that it's not worth anything. So there's, it's really a sort of sleight of hand trick to say we owe it to ourselves because these are different people over different periods of time. And um, one group is having to pay the benefits, whereas this different group is actually getting the benefits. And that is really dangerous for um, any kind of the survival of a society. So that was Hume's view. What do you think about that? Yeah, so I have a, a very difficult time kind of wrapping my head around the logic of, of MMT uh, but I do know that from, you know, a post-Keynesian perspective, the reason for, you know, engaging in that deficit spending is that they are arguing it's not money that they're making kind of a human argument. It's, it's not money or currency that is wealth. Wealth is the creation of stuff. And the reason we engage in this deficit spending is to kind of mobilize these idle resources. 
Um, and so if you're like trying to take it from their perspective, you know, they are basically arguing that the opportunity cost of not doing that outweighs um, actually doing it. Now, I don't, I don't agree with that perspective. And, and as I said, I, I don't quite have an ability to wrap my head around the logical argument. Um, mm -hmm. And also a lot of, you know, advanced economies, you know, we do most uh, Western democracies spend about 40% of GDP through the political process, right? So we're, it's not a US problem. This is a, a, problem that we see a lot of democratic countries engaging in large amounts of public debt and now we're seeing lots of inflation you know what would hume you know somebody who cared about consent what would hume have to say about you know inflation as a tax yeah um that's another so thank you for your own insights about that um yeah uh, hume had uh, he talked about inflation um, and, um, you know, what he called corrupting the currency. So, you know, this was, you know, at a time when, when Kings were doing things like, you know, they would clip off a little portion of the actual physical metal shaving coin, the coins. Yeah. Shaving the coins so that they could get more and then they could, you know, make more coins and people wouldn't notice it so much. So they were doing, you know, these kinds of shenanigans that they were trying to engage in thinking that, you know, if I have more coins then that means I have more wealth. Um, but Hume, this is uh, Hume wrote, uh, discusses what he calls this little problem of an interval. So I'm interested to know what you think about this too. Um, but I'll just tell you what his view is. Um, he says, you know, why would people do that? Why, or why would that gain anybody anything? He said, imagine if overnight, if tomorrow, everybody in the country um, was paid twice as much money as whatever they're being paid now. Would that be a benefit? And he and he says, well, no, that wouldn't make any difference at all. If everybody was suddenly, you know, had twice as much money as they had um, now, it just means that you know all of the goods and services available, the prices of them would just equilibrate. You know, because suddenly you had, you know, it's just a currency, and and as you said, you know, what real wealth is is in the the things you're able to consume and use, and those didn't increase, just the nominal, you know, number of dollars. So, um, so he says, no, that wouldn't make any any difference. He says, so why would um, why would sovereigns, um, so not the nation, but, you know, the kings or the parliament, why would they engage in inflationary tactics or why would they clip the coins and do these things? And he says, because there's an interval. He says, that's the key. There's a time lag. So I print another, you know, suppose instead of just, you know, making everybody twice as wealthy, instead, I just print twice as much money and I have it in my coffers, you know, physically in my coffers as the king. Well, then I can start spending that. And by the time, and there's a time lag that it takes as I spend that increased money, it takes time for the goods and services to then their prices to equilibrate to the increased amount of currency in, uh, in the economy. Because at first, when I first spend it, I'm buying goods and services at the price where whatever price they had under the, um, the previous amount of currency, not at the inflated, the increased amount of currency. So eventually, Hume says, well, it will equilibrate as you're just adding more and more paper currency. Yeah, the prices will equilibrate, will re-equilibrate. That will happen eventually. But in the time period, some people who have it first can get great more goods and services than people who get it much later. So what Hume says is that this is the great incentive to them. This is why they want to keep doing it, um, because it, it enables the king to get stuff right now at the lower price before it goes up to the um, to the inflated price. Um, and the people who then have to pay the inflated price, they're effectively losing out on that. They don't, it's, it's like stealing from them, but they don't realize it because it takes a while for them to figure that out. So they're actually losing value of goods and services, but they don't realize it because it doesn't happen right away and the king gets the benefit at it. So that's why they keep doing it. Yeah, usually it doesn't happen very rapidly and it is a kind of gradual, unnoticeable thing. Um, I think I would probably agree with that. It's got some Austrian flavor to it in terms mm -hmm. of thinking about how inflation with that interval, there's going to be, you know, distortions of relative prices. So yeah. not only is the sovereign going to benefit from having more purchasing power for that short period of time, all of the relative prices throughout the economy are going to be distorted and we're going to start seeing a misallocation mm -hmm. of resources right so it's 
even worse than the picture that Hume has painted. Wow. I okay. Think. So he saw part of it, but not all of it. Ah, yeah, okay. I mean, I, I tend to be pretty Austrian in, in my view <laughs> of, of how that monetary policy works, but um, not everybody would agree. But if you are listening, there is a previous podcast episode where I chat with Chris Coyne about these uh, Austrian monetary uh, issues. So I recommend checking that out. Um, let's see. Hume, I want to go back to his uh, empiricism and his criticisms of, you know, what can we truly know? Mm. Right? It's very difficult for us to sort out causality. Um, what implications does that have for you know how we like what economists should do oh. right um or or you know how should we conduct public policy are there things that should be off limits because we just don't even even empiric empirical evidence might not give us a, a good answer you know what for hume what is the appropriate scope for the political process given uh his view of how the world works yeah, it's how a good, we can understand it. It's a good question. So he was, uh, he was what you might today, we might today call, uh, he, he opposed ideal theory in uh, political theory. So he was not an ideal theorist, meaning he didn't like, um, he didn't like the, uh, the method of trying to imagine what an ideally good society or a perfect society might be. And then trying to figure out, well, what steps do we need to take to more closely approximate this ideally good or this perfect society? Um, he was very he was very nervous about and skeptical of to use a, a term you know the, the term skepticism but he was very skeptical about our ability to actually know what a perfectly good society would be like um, he thought that if we tried to imagine it inevitably it would be a radically oversimplified society with just a few people in it or just a few activities in it there's no way we could actually try to generate um, a a model of society that would reflect human uh, life and all of its complexity and richness and interconnectedness, it would be orders of magnitude too simplified. So it wouldn't actually fit. Um, so he didn't like the idea of ideal theory, but that doesn't mean that he thought that we couldn't figure out ways um, to, that uh, could enable us to improve society. Most improvements in society, he thought, I believe, uh, he thought would come from, as it were, from the bottom up. So if you let hundreds or thousands or millions of people conduct various kinds of experiments in trying to figure out how to improve their own and other people's lives, you're going to get all kinds of new ideas and innovations. Many of them won't work, but some of them will work. And you're going to get a lot more of those than if you just allow, you know, one or two people, you know, the minister or the, the economic expert to come up with ideas, no matter how smart they are, they're never going to come up with as many ideas as millions of people. This is a little bit like you know, the reason why um, no expert can predict the market, um, you know, uh, markets beat experts again and again, because they're in a way corresponding to and capitalizing on the knowledge, the bits of knowledge of millions of people, rather than just the intelligence of one or a few people. Um, so Hume thought that most innovations in society would come from the bottom up if we just allow people to, um, um, to have a go at things, to give a try to things. Um, so that for him means that we, we should have the kinds of um, public institutions that enable that to happen. Um, so going back to his conception of that's why his conception of justice is what it is. Um, preventing people from stealing one another's property without their or using it without permission. That's really just enabling people to have a realm in which to try to innovate and uh, engage in new things. Let as many people trade with each other as want to trade. That's another way to allow for lots of new kinds of experiments. Let people start new businesses, um, even compete with already existing entrenched businesses if they want, because that's the way we get innovation and progress. Um, so um, how did he come to all of those conclusions? And this is back to your question, I guess, uh, you know, more specifically addressing your question about what should economists do. It was looking to um, empirical evidence. So what he thought was you could, we could rely on the past and things we learn about the past to give us suggestions about what to do in the future. Um, but what we should, and maybe this is what you as a professional economist or professional economist should do, what you should work on is um, making, you know, it doesn't mean you can't use theory. So you can use some theory or principles based on your inductive um, analysis of the past. You, you say, well, here's how I think this actually works. 
And then you use that to make very robust, falsifiable predictions. So I think that would be his view. So a really good e economist, a really good political economist is somebody who says, I think this principle, here it is, explains these things that we observed in the past. And if it does, then here's what would happen in these kinds of situations in the future. And you go out and test it. And you do this relentless testing process by more experiment and more observation, winnowing, winnowing away things that are false, winning or, or focusing in on zeroing in on things that are really homing in on things that are true. Um, but that's the process I think he would have thought of political economy and the proper policy or the proper method of an economist as well. But we're using we're still using theory to kind of make sense, you know, to, to form our experiments. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. In the same way that I think, you know, a Newtonian, you know, if you think about Newton, you know, what does a physicist do? OK, well, you know, um, he, here are the principles, here are the Newtonian principles. Here's how I think they would they would apply in this particular case. You know, you so you'd use the theory that you developed based on the past. You try to apply it to a new case or to a, a specific area where it hasn't been studied before, not studied sufficiently before and see how it works out in this case in the, uh, as well. But what he's not doing is like kind of the big data, let the data speak to me, purely looking for patterns in the uh, data with nothing. Yeah. yeah, so that's, you know, we're getting a little bit out of Hume there for, uh, because yeah. there was no such thing as big data. No. <laughs> you know, but I try to make the connection because that yeah. is a big thing today. Like I'm being a pure empiricist. I'm not gonna be biased by any, you know, preconceived notions. I'm just gonna look at this data, look for patterns, you know, that yeah. that is not something that Hume would have. I don't, I don't think so. Done. Yeah. No, I think Hume would say, no, you want to learn from the past and the other great thinkers and the work that's been done in the past, uh, done before you try to learn what you think you can from it. And then you want to try to build on it. You need to be yeah. open to the possibility that you could get it wrong or even that what people have thought in the past is wrong. You do have to be open to that possibility. But you want to, to use the, the term that Newton did. You want to stand on the shoulders of giants. You don't want to start from scratch over and over again. You want to actually build on what and learn from the past and build on it. So we're, we're almost out of time. I want to give you a chance. I like to ask, you know, what ideas of Hume might or, you know, one big idea where you think Hume is, is, is misunderstood that you'd like to kind of set the record straight? Yeah, I think, uh, thank you for asking me that. I guess what I would say is, and this is a bit controversial among Hume scholars, but what I would say is um, the idea that either Hume himself was an atheist or that if you are if you subscribe to reason, if you believe in human rationality, then you must be an atheist. Um, I don't think either of those was true for Hume. Um, I think Hume thought that many of the arguments people gave to support belief in God or to, you know, talking about various aspects of God's existence, um, he thought those arguments didn't work and some of them were terribly wrong. So he did take something of a sledgehammer to some of those kinds of arguments. Um, but I think what Hume was really, um, uh, the conclusion he was really driving to was that human reason is a, uh, a fairly weak tool. <laughs> Um, it, it's not as it's not a tool of nothing. It is not zero. It can do things, um, but we tend to have a much inf an inflated view of its actual capacities. Um, so Hume believed that we could make progress over time, um, but it took time and it would take lots of us working together and with lots of experiments and uh, uh, making these kinds of falsifiable predictions that we were talking about a second ago. Um, now, did that mean that Hume was an atheist? I don't think so. I think Hume thought that most of the arguments people gave for believing in God didn't actually succeed. And he himself didn't see or hadn't come up with an argument that he thought did succeed. He thought they all failed. So for him, what that meant was I'm not rationally persuaded. There is no argument that has persuaded me rationally. Doesn't mean there can't be. Doesn't mean there can't be a God. Um, it just means that I haven't got seen the argument for it quite yet. Um, so I think that's a that's a subtle difference. It's not maybe a very you know robust difference, but I think it's an important difference. And that I think leads to, you know, maybe what I would say is one of the enduring parts of, um, of Hume's view, which is that, you know, being skeptical about things um, and being cognizant of the limits of our, the limitations of our knowledge and the limits of our abilities to know um, doesn't mean that we can't know anything. It doesn't mean that we can never have a progress. It doesn't mean that we can't improve our lives. We can. And I think, you know, we've talked earlier about how Hume seemed to have such a joy of life. He seemed to have such a zest of living. 
um, despite the fact that he was cognizant of the human limitations and knowledge. I think that's why, because he thought there was enormous promise um, in the ability for human beings to improve their lives, to learn about their world. He didn't think it would all happen because of you know one minister or one anointed expert. It would be because as a race, as a, as a, as a species, um, we are all contributing marginally, just like what you get in the increasing prosperity in the market, just like what you get in increasing knowledge and science. These are community efforts from the bottom up. And I think he was joyful at the prospect of what that could become in time. So at the end of the book, you have a great list of additional resources for people to check out, additional readings. Um, in a, outside of that list, do you have any blogs, you know, videos, yeah. any other recommendations if people want to learn more about the ideas of David Hume, where should they look? Ah, yes. Well, um, as you probably know, um, the Fraser Institute has a series of videos about uh, Hume and about, this, about the elements of this book. Um, and summaries of it. So I would recommend taking a look at those. They're fantastic. They really are well done. Fraser Institute does a fantastic job with that. Um, but what I would also recommend is, um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, Hume wrote a lot of short essays on all kinds of different topics. All of those essays are available. We've collected that we have them. They are all available in various, um, various different editions. But one where you can see it online is with Liberty Fund's online library of liberty. So if you just Google online library of liberty, you'll find um, um, different editions, but you know, in HTML, in PDFs, in different formats, you will find all of the essays of Hume. And I would recommend just go take a look at the list of the titles and uh, find a couple that are of interest to you and read them. Hume was a fantastic essayist and he really was a master of the English language. And I give you this one piece of advice. You're gonna tend to wanna read it fast uh, because it's, you know, it seems like it's relatively straightforward and simple. Slow down when you read Hume. When you read Hume, every sentence matters. Every paragraph is making a point. So take your time and enjoy it. But I would say look at the list of those uh, essays and and pick a few that matter to, that uh, interest you and read those. Well, I know I'm going to do that. Especially check out the one uh, that you had mentioned on his view of the end of life decisions. Yes, so that's saying, very yes. interesting to me. Thank you so much for spending so much time with me talking about David Hume and uh, the other scholars of the Scottish Enlightenment. Um, and you know, this has been excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure, Rosie. Thank you. You've been listening to Essential Scholars, a new podcast series that explores the ideas and insights of some of history's most influential thinkers. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to subscribe and head over to EssentialScholars.org to learn more. See you next time. Thank you.